Hi everyone, it's Andrew. Today I would like to teach you how to find the domain, vertical asymptotes, and horizontal asymptotes of the following rational function. Let's first focus on the domain. So when you think about domain, what I want you to do is ask yourself a question. Are there any values of x that when you plug it into this function give an overall like wacky result? Okay, or overall undefined result or we can't do it. So what you want to do is look at it in three parts, numerator, denominator, and then overall. So in terms of the numerator, there's no problem. I can plug in any value I want for x, right? You can square a negative, a positive, or zero. It doesn't matter how big or small it is, right? Now, if this were something like square rooted or whatever, and this wasn't square, you know, there, there could be then certain limitations that it couldn't be negative, et cetera, right? But there really is no problem here. Next, I look at the denominator, same thing. I can cube any number, I can square any number, and I can plug any number in here, right? And they're all added. There's no square root over anything. There's nothing crazy. So that's fine. Then what I do is I look at the overall function. I'm like, well, I have a fraction. Is there anything about a fraction that's special that I can't have? And it turns out that the answer is yes. In the denominator, you cannot have a value of zero, right? And to have any number 10 divided by zero, it doesn't make any sense, right? How many times does nothing fit into 10? Now you might say nothing times, but not really. You can't fit nothing into something. It's nothing. It's undefined. Or in other words, you can fit nothing in infinitely many times. Okay, it's 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 an idea. It's not you you can't do it. All right. Um, so this is an un, this having a zero in the denominator will give an undefined result. So what we need to do now is we need to set this thing equal to zero and solve. All right. Now, what's probably the best way to do this? So we have x cubed plus nine x squared plus fourteen x equaling zero. What might be a good way to do this is to kind of factor it. So I notice that I have an x in common in each, so I'm going to pull out an x, okay? So what's left then is x squared plus 9x plus 14, 14 equaling now 0. And then I ask myself, okay, do I know two numbers that might multiply to 14, but that then add to a positive 9? And what do you think? What two numbers multiply to 14, but can add to positive 9? Well, it, I think it's just 7 and 2, right? So it's going to be x plus 7, and then x plus 2. And that's equaling zero. And now you basically have three things you're going to set equal to zero. You're going to have x equals zero. That's simple. Then you have x plus seven equaling zero. And then you're going to have x, x plus two equaling zero. And both of these then would be solved for x. And you would have your three values here. Okay, x being zero, x being negative seven, and x being negative two. Cool. Now, um, these are the values that if you plugged it into this function down here in the denominator, it would give an overall value of zero here and it'd be undefined, right? You can also plug, well, you can also plug in the function here, y equals, and you can do the table. You can look at the table and see what happens to those values. Actually, you know what? Why don't we do that quickly? Because I'm going to plug it in later. So watch. So you got x squared. So let's plug in x squared minus one, close parentheses, uh, and then you know, do divided by now, open the parentheses. You're going to have x cubed, x cubed then plus 9x squared plus 14x. Close parentheses and now go to your table. And notice, you see there's errors, right? Negative 1, oh, excuse me, 0. When x is 0, er, you, give, you got an error. When x is negative 2, er, there's an error. Can't calculate it. And when x is equal to negative 7, er, you get an error, right? Every time you get an error, you get an error. All right, that's enough of that. So, um, right. So where was I? The domain. Okay. Domain. So sorry if you hear my stomach growling. I am so hungry at the moment. Uh, I think I'm going to stop after this one and get something to eat finally. Um, so the domain, we're going to have all real numbers, all real numbers, except, except for, uh, zero, negative seven and negative two. Okay. So that's the domain. Now, next thing is the vertical asymptotes. Now, it turns out when we do vertical asymptotes, what you're going to do is you want to first make sure you have everything in fully factored form. Now, on a problem like this, you know, maybe we have some common factors and whatnot. You know, this I can see is kind of a perfect square. All right. So what I would do is I would write this now in fully factored form. Okay. So this is a perfect square on the top. So that's just going to be x plus 1 and x minus 1. And then we're going to divide it now by 
I already factored this, so I'm not going to go through that whole thing again, right? But there's going to be x, there's going to be x plus 7, and this is then going to be x plus 2. And what I'm going to see now is do any factors cancel? Now in this problem, no, the answer is no, right? None of those factors will cancel. And therefore, what I do is I set then this denominator equal to 0, and then I solve for the zeros of x, meaning what values of x give an overall value of 0 here. Okay, now we already did that. We already did that. So we don't have to do that again. Okay, we already did that. But however, imagine if this value up here was x plus 2. x plus 2. What would happen here is that this x plus 2 cancels. All right, that goes bye-bye. And then what I would be left with is this. And all I would do now is I would take this and set it equal to 0. Okay, to find the vertical asymptotes. When you're finding though the domain, you don't really have to go through that. Okay, you can just set this thing equal to zero and go about your business, All right? But when finding the vertical asymptotes, there's something special kind of happens when you get factors that might cancel. All right, in this problem, it doesn't matter, but I just want to kind of teach you in case the problem changes on you. Now, um, we already, so basically we already did all this work. So we should realize, we should have three then vertical asymptotes. All right, and I'll graph it in a little bit, but we'll, we should have these three vertical asymptotes. The next thing is to take care of the horizontal asymptotes. All right, now the horizontal asymptotes, you got to ask yourself a question. Is the function going to be top heavy, equally heavy, or bottom heavy? Okay, in other words, locate your highest powers of x in the numerator and the denominator separately. Highest power of x in the numerator is squared. Highest power of x in the denominator is cubed. I don't care about any of this stuff. And therefore, x squared over x cubed, the x cubed is greater, and therefore that would be considered a bottom heavy. This is a bottom heavy function. If this was x cubed, this would be equally heavy. It does not matter, again, that you have x squared also down here in x. It doesn't matter. Highest power of x on the top, highest power of x on the bottom, that's what you're focused on. And if this were, let's say, to the fourth, then this would be a top heavy function. Now, it turns out that you can memorize this if you like, but for all bottom heavy functions, the horizontal asymptote will always exist at y equals 0, okay, y equals 0. And the reason why is because basically what we're trying to do when we think about horizontal asymptote is we're, is we're trying to like, to, you know, kind of define the end behavior, so to speak, of the function, right? Now, um, in determining the end behavior, I want to think about what happens when x becomes really, really large in the positive direction and what happens to x when it becomes really, really large in the negative direction. In other words, what I'm kind of doing, you know, is I'm trying to find the limit here, the limit as x approaches infinity, you know, positive, negative, whatever. And if you think about this, any value you plug in for x, okay, you're going to square it, but then on the bottom, you're going to cube it. And what happens is over time, this cube is going to overpower the square on the top. It's even going to overpower these terms. So what happens is the denominator gets bigger and bigger faster than the numerator. So the bottom value is becoming bigger and bigger, and it's faster than the numerator. And therefore, you'll have a bigger value in the denominator than in the numerator, and that's going to go to zero, right? What happens when you have 10 over a million? It's a small fraction, and I, I don't even know how many zeros I have here. Maybe that's a million. Sure. Um, you know, this thing is very close to zero. I know it's not zero, but it's going to become close, okay? And eventually it will arrive, all right? So that's kind of the idea there, and I'm getting out of breath. It's probably not a good thing. Probably not a good thing. Time to exercise. Okay, anyway, so that's the horizontal asymptote. Now, why don't we graph this? So hit graph. We already have the function in there. And look, look at this graph, okay? So let's take this and maybe blow it up a little bit. Now, we said we have one horizontal asymptote, and it should be at y equaling 0. And I think we can definitely see that, right? We definitely have this horizontal asymptote y equals 0. But where, where are our... Vertical asymptotes. Well, you have one here. You have one here. And because I'm zoomed out a little bit, but you can kind of almost see if you, you see this thing kind of, you see this part kind of turning in a little bit here. See it turning in. All right, that's turning up. So, and what are the values here? Well, this was x equaling 0. This was x equaling negative 2. And this was x equaling negative 7. Isn't that what we said? Sure. Right, that is. Okay, so it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Um, please help us out by liking and subscribing. Maybe even tell some of your classmates. And check out the descriptions below because we're going to constantly be updating things for you 
providing things to help you through your class. Um, we have thousands of videos out there as well. Solve solutions for problems, chemistry, physics, mathematics, whole lot of stuff coming. You know, on your exams, you're going to see problems, right? Don't, you have to understand the theories and whatnot, but you have to know how to apply it. I see a lot of students focus on too much on the theory, but not the application. All right. You're tested on applications. So you got to do a ton of problems. All right. So check out our resources because that's what we, that's what we specialize in. We got thousands of example problems solved out there for you. That's how you're going to become a better problem solver. And that's how you're going to do better on your test by doing a lot, a lot of problems. Okay. See you soon.